Hello, everyone, and welcome to a joint NACDO Better Bike Share Partnership public webinar on linking bike share and transit. My name is Nicole Payne. I'm the program manager for our Bike Share and Cities for Cycling networks here at NACDO, and I'll be moderating this webinar. For those of you who are new to NACDO, we are the National Association of City Transportation Officials. We are a coalition of almost 60 city transportation departments and tra transit agencies across North America. Our goal is to help cities share information and best practices that can make better places for people with safe, sustainable, accessible, and equitable transportation choices that support a strong economy and vibrant quality of life. Webinars like this one are key to NACDO's mission, bringing together city transportation departments, operators, advocates, and other interested parties together to learn from each other helping cities develop city-focused design standards that meet urban needs and conditions, and providing a platform for leading and new voices in transportation. The topic at hand today is linking bike share and transit. Bike share is typically considered a first, last mile solution, and there is lots of data from cities around the world suggesting a very high crossover between bike share users and transit riders. In Chicago, it's around 30% of bike share users who use Divi to connect to transit. In London and New York, it's even higher. But despite this huge crossover market, very few U.S. systems have actually linked their bike share and transit, and transit transportation interfaces in ways that make getting around easier for their residents. This is a marked difference from bike share systems elsewhere in Europe, where fare car integration has been in place for years. This integration is important because improving the public transit ex experience is essential to urban mobility, efficiency, and economic growth. It's a core goal of bike share. And for cities looking to make bike share useful to more and more diverse users, integrating with other mass transit services is the next frontier. So the question here today is how can North American cities and bike share operators jumpstart connections between bike share and transit? What can we do to make those connections easier for our users, especially in places where full fare cart integration is politically complicated or jurisdictionally different, difficult, I'm sorry. How can partnerships be built and what can be done now? The panelists we have brought to together today will show us options that are simple, user-focused, and often low cost. We have with us today bike share and transit operator pair, James Davies of Bubbler Bikes, and Brendan Conway of Milwaukee County Transit System. We also have David White and Adams Carroll of PGH Bike Share in Pittsburgh. They're going to discuss the how-tos, lessons learned, and their best practices for how to build better transit and bike share relationships and partnerships. You'll hear how these collaborative projects came about and what it takes to develop a successful cross-mode program. Some quick logistics. We're going to leave a segment of about 20 minutes at the end of the presentations for Q&A, but you can begin sending in your questions as they come up. Which brings me to thing number two, asking questions. On your on-screen control panel, there is a question box. Please type in your questions as you think of them and we'll try to get through as many as possible at the end. If you think of a question after the fact, write it anyway, and we'll try to get it answered at the end or we'll connect you with the appropriate speaker after the call. Yes, we will be releasing the recording and slides from this webinar on our website within the next few days. NACDO will be hosting webinars like this on an ongoing basis so please check out our website at www.nacto.org. And as an additional point, we will follow up on unanswered questions at the end of the Q&A segment. Um, we'll send them to our presenters, and once answered, we'll send them out to all of you all here today as soon as possible. So please feel free to begin writing in questions as soon as you think of them. With all that said, get your question box geared up, and let's get started. David? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, happy
happy to be uh, participating in the webinar today. We're calling in from sunny Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where it's been snowing for a couple of days. I'm joined by our operations director, Adams Carroll, who is in many ways even more qualified to talk about uh, today's topic than I am. But um, I know we've got a lot to get through, so we'll get started right away here um, and jumping into transit integration in Pittsburgh. Um, Adams, why don't you jump in? Yeah, sure. So uh, just to set the scene here in Pittsburgh, we're a small nonprofit uh, bike share operator. We launched our system in May of 2015, uh, really with the goal uh, and the mission of expanding access to public transportation. Um, so as we designed our system, we really uh, considered, you know, locating our stations uh, uh, close to public transit um, within the catchment area. And we also tried to design our service to be more like a transit trip. So we were one of the first systems to, to really push single trip pricing, um, more like you would pay for, for a bus trip rather than uh, require people to, um, to purchase a membership. Um, we have 50 stations and 500 bikes. Uh, we'll be expanding this year. Um, and um, I, I wanna kind of talk about how um, we, think of uh, public transit integration uh, along sort of a spectrum. Um, so this slide here has a lot of information, which I, um, I apologize uh, for, um, but um, we'll um, kind of briefly walk through the, the idea of um, how the topic that we're discussing today, which is a, um, a technical integration, a smart card, basically integration, and, um, and integrated marketing sits upon a foundation of other types of transit integration. And so, um, you know, if you're considering pursuing this, you really should also be considering um, how robust is your city's transit um, network? You know, if this is gonna be something that's gonna be valuable to your customers, you really need to have a, a good, a high frequency, robust transit system in place. You need to make sure that your stations are well located near uh, premium transit and within um, the service area of premium transit uh, and really make that your system intelligible to a transit user. So um, that gets down to pricing and, and uh, your operating hours and things like that. Um, what, we're, what we're not gonna be talking about today uh, really is that full fare integration, which for a lot of us, I think is the holy grail of, of integrating bike share and transit. Um, it's a little bit outside of my area of expertise, but you know, my understanding is that there's really not a lot of clear guidance um, from the FTA or, or not really any clear examples of this having been implemented in the United States. And so it's hard for a transit agency to say yes to that kind of a project that would involve a lot of development work and new accounting systems to be put in place uh, in, in order for it to, to, to succeed. Um, and so when, when we were thinking about how we could better integrate our system with our transit authority and expand access to more riders, people who may not have a credit or a debit card, um, but are, are, are already using the, the transit smart card, uh, we really worked to create a, um, a program that would be easy for the transit authority to say yes to. So I'll let David talk a little bit more about how we structured it. Yeah, so we kind of went for the next best thing in terms of that stored value. And the way we did that was to just try to eliminate as many ways or reasons that the transit agency could say no. So we, we wanted them to say yes. And so we pitched it as a pilot project we took advantage of the existing technologies, both in our system and on their platforms. We basically told them we'll do it without any type of accounting integration, which was the big hurdle. Um, and then we, 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 um, we implemented it for free 15 minute rides. Um, so every single transit card holder gets unlimited number of, of 15 minute trips in Pittsburgh. And the transit card here in Pittsburgh is, is a card that you're able to purchase with a credit card, but you're also able to purchase it with cash. It's a $1 card and you can load cash value onto it without ever connecting it to a personal identification. So you can 
keep an anonymous card with cash value only. And so that that was the um, that was the real cool thing for us. It's a way to offer a cash um, entry point, a cash payment entry point into Bike Share, and it's a way to to really capture all of the transit agency users. So. Um, of course, after the pilot ends, um, we really thought it was an important step to be able to evaluate it and to, to build into the contract that we have with our transit agency to build in an opportunity to extend that pilot really easily uh, also. Um, so I'm going to jump into kind of the technical details of what that looks like. Um, we wanted to design the system to be really easy for the customers. That was the most important. Um, both our existing customers and those new customers that we hope to attract. Um, so the whole goal was to be able to allow people to use a bike share, uh, to use Healthy Ride, just by taking advantage of the bus pass or the or the smart card transit pass that's already in, in their pocket. Um, so the first step for us is that the customer has to tap that pass onto one of our kiosks. Um, we have uh, 50 kiosks around the city. The kiosk itself has an RFID reader and the, the, um, the touch screen, the screen at the kiosk then prompts the user to enter in a mobile phone number. Um, this is the point in the, in the workflow where the customer also is clicking a checkbox to say and reviewing, you know, reviewing our terms and conditions and our liability waiver. So this was a really critical step for us in order to operationalize this. We had to make sure that each person um, was able to review that information. Um, and then we uh, send them a text message as soon as that happens. Um, in fact, kind of simultaneously, our hardware partner is called Nextbike. They are doing a quick database check using the whitelist of the entire universe of smart card user ID numbers, which we get from the transit agency. Um, and if that, so we're just basically confirming that it is a card that's accepted from the transit provider. Um, and then in the back end, the user doesn't see this, but we then link those accounts. So the existing transit card accounts account gets linked to a to a healthy ride account. If the customer is a new customer and they just entered their phone number and we do not have an account for them, we have an automatic account creation um, event that happens. And then, as I said, the text message uh, is also an auto event in which um, we're sending out a message to that new customer um, confirming their the transaction. There was no transaction, but confirming the event and then sending them a, uh, a, a unique PIN number um, that becomes their, their sort of password on the system. Um, from that point on, the customer is able to tap their bus pass on any one of our bikes. So our bikes do also have an RFID reader on them. This is a really um, critical point in this, uh, in this journey that we're on um, and, and not every, bike share system has this, but we really um, were happy to be able to take advantage of the fact that we do have a, a smart bike system that, that's able to make this happen. So when a customer taps their, their uh, smart card, their connect card onto one of our bikes, the bike automatically unlocks and, um, and creates uh, a, a new trip. Um, so I know that um, no one really loves long videos. We have a 30 second video here. Um, it's not going to take long, but why don't we go ahead and get this started that uh, better kind of outlines the process. that's a little sped up but it, it does take about 30 seconds to get an account um, started with the system if you don't have one um, so we're really happy with how easy it is for our users and I, I want to take a moment at this point to reflect on the 15 minute um, trip time that that we offer as part of this 
um, partnership. Um, th that's a, a duration that we get a lot of questions about, and there's a few reasons why we really like it. Um, one, we looked at data from NACTO um, about the average trip time for a bike share member. Uh, and, and I think nationwide it hovers around 12 minutes. So we know that that's a really useful length of time for a first or last mile trip um, or a quick trip you know, during a lunch break to run an errand or, or go grab something to eat. Um, so it makes a lot of sense from that perspective. It also is great um, in that it, it differentiates against our more premium options, um, our, our paid memberships, uh, our longer rental duration. And so it was like kind of a nice new product that we're able to offer in the, in the options of uh, pricing that we have. Great, thanks Adam. Uh, let's see, click there. Yep, so um, from a high level, we went into this project um, with some, some pretty basic uh, goals in mind. Increase the number of our trips, increase the and expand um, the number of people who register with our system, and then to be able to more easily measure the revenue impacts of this project. Um, and then kind of qualitatively, just generally supporting the, the concept of transit in our region um, and, and creating some better awareness for, for both our brand as well as uh, the transit agency. Um, and, and we're really happy to, to be able to report out on some of the outcomes of those objectives. So um, Adams, uh, maybe jump in here too. Sure, yeah, so the first, uh, we're now onto about three months of running this trial and um, we have seen an increase in our uh, total trips so we're up about 4.3%. Um, it's a very modest growth, but we're also in um, definitely the slowest part of our season where uh, it's, you know, today probably unpleasant to be out riding a bike in Pittsburgh. We've got about eight inches of snow that's been piling up over the past few days, and it's pretty cold. So to see that the ridership is growing, uh, even in, you know, the, the depths of winter for me is a really healthy sign, and I'm eager to continue monitoring this as we move into our peak ridership season. Um, I, I do think that it's uh, um, been uh, definitely a result of the work that we've done with Connect Card that these trips have increased because uh, honestly, for the since since we've launched, we our, our ridership has been pretty flat. Um, we haven't made any changes to the number of bikes or stations. So we feel like we had kind of saturated the amount of trips we could achieve with our current um, network. Um, so to see that it's now growing uh, in absence of those changes is really positive, and I believe that as we add stations and bikes this year into the system, it'll it'll be like uh, throwing jet fuel fuel onto this, hopefully. So um, one interesting note is that uh, of you know all the trips taken um, since we launched this pilot, 20% of them uh, were taken by um, users who had uh, activated the Connect Card partnership onto their account. So that's showing, you know, one in every five riders has already um, joined this program. Um, I think for, for that uh, kind of early success in, in adoption, it shows people are really interested in this. Um, so I think that that's a, also a very positive sign. Um, a big goal that we had was to make bike share accessible to more people and to really um, attract uh, the Port Authority's um, users and we've seen a huge huge um, amount of new users compared to the same period last year we've had uh, nearly a 17 percent increase in new um, registrations and part of that was outreach events that um, that our team did at the beginning of the pilot project but even now as we move uh, further into winter we're seeing you know just organic growth in the amount of new users uh, who are who are accessing the system um, and then the, the big question, of course, is, um, you know, what's the cost of, of offering basically free bike share? Um, we weren't really sure how this would play out. So the objective that we set was really to just measure and analyze the impacts. Um, you know, on the one hand, attracting a bunch of new users has the potential to generate new trips. And so maybe we've gained revenue from that. Of course, we're also giving away rides that people used to have to pay for. So um, we, um, we definitely have seen a drop in revenue in spite of the trips going up. Um, but this is really good information for us. You know, as a nonprofit, I think 
we're really satisfied with the adoption of the program and the you know increased accessibility of the system. And so we think that this is a, an easy program that we could approach a foundation or a corporate sponsor to underwrite some of the ongoing operating costs um, of offering free bike share. Cool, yep. So this is a number we're really comfortable with. Um, and I guess I'm gonna shift gears and get into kind of how we effectively talk about this to the public and, and why we think that it has been successful. A big part of it is just the public awareness. Um, so we approached this uh, kind of from three different bins of things that we had to do. We had to figure out the technical details. We had to convince the transit agency leadership, and then we had to tell people about it. Um, and so for us, we wanted something that was really easy to understand immediately, a graphic that people could latch onto. And we use the same graphic and same messaging concept across a really wide variety of uh, messaging platforms. Um, the transit agency did agree to um, advertise for us on the interior of all the buses and then on the exterior of many buses. Um, and then of course we do the same kind of messaging at our stations and across all of our digital platforms, including social media and newsletters, and then very specific outreach events. So we're excited in 2018 to be able to bring on some additional staff to really uh, some, some neighborhood ambassadors that will really be um, working on this messaging at, a, at the community level a lot more uh, than what we did in 2017. Um, and then real quick, we've just got some kind of high level takeaways um, from from the coverage that we received, we've got we've received national attention based on the this pilot project. Um, a great um, response, we think, from around the country for people who are interested in this. We received a lot of local attention. Um, pretty much every major media outlet here in Pittsburgh was was a uh, real gave real positive coverage um, from the earned media standpoint. And then um, this, it was a really easy and fun thing to measure through our social media channels um, with some great, great results there. Um, so it's been, it's been, um, it's been a fun a period to explain this to the public and to get the reactions from the public. Um, but this is, this is really kind of just as important as either of those other two bins of work that need to get done because it's really clear to us that that people. Um, the only way that this is successful is if people are aware of it. Um, and so this is our last slide. We've just got some kind of big takeaways from what we've accomplished. Um, the number one thing is to just make it easy for the transit provider, the transit agent the agency to say yes. Um, someone asked me, you know, did you think that technical integration was harder or, or was it more of the soft skills and the people skills? And it really was like 90% um convincing people that we should do this and 10 percent actually doing it the technical integration took us about two weeks and um convincing the leadership of the city and the leadership of the transit agency that this that this was the right direction took about two years <laughs> so um that's the top one and then making it easier for the customers to use um, this is also something that we put a lot of effort into to make sure that the the user experience at each one of our kiosks and on the bikes is fairly intuitive and it doesn't take a lot of time and it allows people to use the very same transit pass that they have in their pocket without kind of doing an additional step. Um, but the biggest thing that we're excited about is that for us, it really shows that there is this demand from the public to, to integrate these services. And we think that by integrating bike share and transit services, that whole um, world becomes a lot more competitive in relation to other private operators, car sharing services and ride sharing services. So um, this is this is a great thing. Um, and uh, and uh, I guess kind of in in that um, in that conclusion, we're happy to turn it over to the presenters. Um, we are going to have our information, our contact information available for anyone and uh, happy to jump in during the question and answer time. Thanks, everyone. Awesome. Thank you so much, um, David and Adams. And um, as a reminder, we do see you all's questions coming through. Um, they're great questions, but we do have a Q&A session at the um, end of our next presentation. So we're going to work through the questions and answer as many as possible. 
But thank you so much, David and Adams. The growth in trips and users um, and revenue is just really impressive. So now we're going to transition to Brendan Conway of MCTS and um, James of um, Bubbler Bikes. James and Brendan. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is Brendan Conway from uh, Milwaukee County Transit System. And if you look at our first slide, um, this is just very briefly a little bit about who we are. Um, uh, we are the state's largest transit system. Um, we provide about 40 million rides a year. Uh, we travel uh, more than 18 million miles um, across uh, county. We have 60 routes and about 5,500 bus stops. Next slide. And this is just similar brief overview of Bubbler. Uh, in 2017, we had 90, just over 91,000 trips taken, 367,000 miles traveled, offset 349,000 pounds of carbon, um, and 80% of our stations are co-located with MCTS stops, leading into our partnership here. And so if you can look at the next slide. So um, I came here to Milwaukee County Transit about three years ago. Um, and one of the first things I did is I reached out to the executive director then of uh, Bubbler um, to, to talk about ways we could work together. And one of the kind of most natural ways is, um, as James had just mentioned, we have 80% of their stations are near intersections that we serve with, with one of our routes. And so we uh, started uh, announcing um, as it pulls up to that stop, it will announce on the bus uh, the uh, intersection and any other connecting routes. And it will also just say Bubbler Bike Station. And as you see there on the right, um, that is what it also looks like on all of our real-time information. So on our website, on our app, um, if you click on a stop, it will also tell you that there is a bubbler bike station within a quarter mile of there. Um, the audio announcements alone are reaching thousands of people um, and the uh, online locations uh, or uh, notifications are you know, probably hundreds of thousands of more uh, hits at least per year. There you go, the next slide. Um, as part of the partnership, Bubbler also co-branded 50 of our bikes with the Milwaukee County Transit logo and MCTS uh, put up Bubbler plus MCTS signs, about 300 of them there in uh, their buses. But when we first put them up, the website basically just went to sort of some general information about Bubbler and MCTS, um, but now it goes to something cooler. <laughs> And so uh, just look at the next slide. One of the things that we spent about a year working on was a, a smart card. Um, here at MCTS, we've had a smart card that you can use to load fare and passes since uh, about 2014. It uses a, a certain chip. Um, Bubbler had a different chip and a fob that they use, um, and it was a different technology. So we spent some time, um, and uh, James can talk more about the technology behind it, but it was the Bustler uh, which is basically just a sticker that goes on the back of our smart card and you can then use it to get on the bus and it also works with the bubbler bike stations right yep and on the sticker there you can sort of see the rfid thing underneath it um when we first started talking about this and realized that they were completely different technologies there's at first like oh so that's sort of going to be a hard barrier to overcome but then we also realized that they're completely different technologies there's no crosstalk so uh, we did some testing to make sure that there was no crosstalk, no weird uh, error signals or anything like that. Um, but because they're on totally different frequencies, there was no no problem there. And so um, it's worked really well. And with that sticker, uh, I've now had one on, I, I've had a sticker on one of my cards for probably almost two years now, uh, or a year and a half that is still still holding up very well. So. <clears throat> So after so we introduced it in uh, the end of August, beginning of September. So that is the beginning of our slow season. Um, even with that, we've had more than 750 trips taken since the pass was introduced. Um, it's hard for us to sort of measure when we're talking about like percent increase in trips because we're we even this last our last quarter I think we added 21 new stations. So it's hard to sometimes tease out the variables between what what is causing what. Um, but looking specifically at our Bustler card members, we've had 750 trips taken. Um, since then, and as I said, it's definitely a slower time for us. Yeah. And one of the things we had heard from riders uh, and bike users is that even though you could have still had your smart card and you could have still had your fob, just simply sometimes switching from one to the next is enough of a pain. Uh, it's one more thing to carry. And so the idea was, um, you know, to kind of steal an idea from the Lord of the Rings, uh, you know, kind of a one card to rule them all. And it would, you know, it, it makes your life easier. Um, and but since we we're two separate organizations, we had to jump through some hurdles. But you know, happy to see that that's been going really well, and actually was pretty painless, I think. Yeah, yeah. And so we're looking at other uh, possible improvements on the next slide as we 
think, well, now that we've kind of tackled this, what other things um, can we do? So one thing, so right now, someone has to go get their M card or may already have an M card and then they order their bustler through bubbler and then they get a sticker and they've got to put on the sticker. So it becomes one card, but there's a couple steps involved. So one thing um, we could, we've talked a little bit about is if with every bustler sticker, we just include an M card that has whatever, $5 on it or something. Um, so the sticker's already applied and um, make it just remove one more barrier. Um, we've also been talking about hosting public engagement meetings together. Uh, Milwaukee has a lot of transit users, but they're not necessarily vocal about it. And so trying to just get some increased um, uh, speak, people talking about their transit use and how it impacts them and how different uh, choices made at the county level impact their lives. And as we and as and like we heard in Pittsburgh, we we're also looking at about eight inches of snow that we received over the last 24 hours. So this is uh, top of mind, um, looking at ways that we could have potentially joint mates, maintenance agreements uh, around some of our uh, our stations that we serve or, and and bus shelters and same with the the uh, bubbler ones. So it's not two different crews going out and having a shovel or clean up. And what might that look like if it was just one group or one person and, you know, hopefully we could do it more efficiently and save a little bit of, uh, of money along the way as well. So then on the next slide, <clears throat> some other thoughts, just uh, we had a student from University of Milwaukee looking at uh, bike on bus. Um, whenever someone puts their bike on an MCTS bus, the driver hits a little button and records that. And so looking at where there is lots of bike on bus usage, some of the highest densities of bike on bus usage and bus usage are not yet well served by bubbler because they're a little bit further out from the uh, urban core, so to speak. And so West Dallas, the one on the farthest left, uh, did just get stations installed in November. So I'm interested to see uh, how the bustler usage looks in West Dallas as com and if, as we eventually get stations in these other other places. Just compared to currently, we don't we're not well serving some of these areas where it looks like there'd be the most possible usage. So. Yeah. And on our buses, we do about 160,000 uh, bike boardings a year, um, as we've been averaging that for the last few years. So then as we last, last slide, as we look in the future, um, certainly, you know, we have this great partnership, this great relationship, and what more can we do with it? Um, co-branding, co-messaging, and I guess uh, speaking with one voice. Yeah. As MCTS has rolled out a new app, then it's going to be available for Android this spring. So we want to make sure that that's something that we that we can help them push out um, to our users as well. So stuff like that. Awesome. Thank you so much, James and Brendan, for our insight on the Milwaukee County and Bubbler partnership. We're looking forward to hearing about your progress and expanding your reach. So we're now going to move to Q&A. As another quick reminder, we're going to try and get through as many questions as possible. If you think of a question after the fact, write it in anyway, and we'll try to get it answered at the end, or we'll connect with you, or we'll connect you with the appropriate speaker after the call. So our first question is, uh, or rather, we have many questions for PGH um, concerning the 15-minute limit on connected trips. How have you addressed issues of charging overages? Theft and liability. Um, this is David. I'll jump in. So, what happens uh, is when a customer who has registered through the Connect Card platform rides a trip or takes a trip that's over 15 minutes, that person receives an automatic text message from us that says you've exceeded the free ride time. Uh, through the through the project and you need to now connect a payment method directly with us in order to continue using your account um, That's worked really well. We have seen an increase in the number of people who then go on to complete their profile at that point We you know, we capture their name and and payment information um, So that that's an easy way for us to do it um, we we have seen um, some small amounts of vandalism and theft. It's really well within what we had budgeted for. So that was another kind of um, concern for us. And, you know, in addition to the revenue impact to our organization, it was, our, you know, are we going to lose 20 bikes from this project? And we haven't. 
um, we've we um, we've we're really kind of happy with with where where that is. Yeah, I think my my uh, thought going into it is that the, you know we like probably any bike share system or even transit agency for that matter. Um, you know, there'll always be people who are motivated to vandalize your equipment or or try to try to steal it or whatever. It's very small. Um, most people, I think, want to just um, do the right thing and be a part of the system and have, you know, these options available to them. So um, people here have been, you know, very, um, very uh, supportive of the project. And I think see um, Healthy Ride as, you know, something that sort of belongs to them as part of the Pittsburgh community. So we haven't really had a lot of issues with it. Um, but it does kind of drive in the point that if this is something that's important to your organization or, or as a you know bike share operator, for example, you do have to kind of be willing to, um, you know, uh, look at what barriers are in con your control, what which ones can you get rid of if you're willing to assume a little bit more exposure or risk. Um, and, you know, in many ways you, you can make uh, some really meaningful choices, mobility options available to people by doing that. Awesome. This is a, another question for um, you in Pittsburgh. Um, does the contract you have with your transit agency include payment to Healthy Ride for the unlimited 15-minute trips? If so, can you share the details of that contract? Um, again, you don't have to do it right now. We will send a follow-up, um, David and Adam, so um, you don't have to do all the details. But um, the details are really easy because there is no payment from them to us. We turned it on okay. as a pilot and we said we're going to do this for free and, and then measure the impact to the revenue. And then once we have some actual numbers about what we think this will cost us, which we're getting closer to that now, um, then we can really kind of return to them and say, here's, here's the dollar amount that we need. Great. Um, has either city been able to track actual trips that use both bike transit and the map where they begin and end? Uh, we could speak in Milwaukee. I mean, we don't, um, we, we're, we're not currently, and I think that would be a tough nut to crack. Um, we, we certainly have lots of information about where, where, where we are boarding bikes, as you saw that one slide. Um, and I, I assume Bubbler has, they know obviously the stations they're using, but where they go from there, um, we don't yet have anything in anyone's pockets that's kind of tracking them back to and from. Um, we're working on a few things, but nothing that would quite do that yet. Uh, I'll jump in from Pittsburgh. Uh, we do have the same, you know, RFID basically um, identifier uh, for both the Port Authority system and the Health Ride system. So that would be possible here. Uh, we're, we're definitely interested in that. We have um, looked at our data um, and the, our transit authority has expressed interest in looking at their data. Um, so that's definitely an area that we'd like to investigate further. But I can just say, you know, from what we've seen from our data, we're seeing a lot more really short trips um, starting and ending at some of our busway stations and our um, light rail stations, uh, where somebody's making you know a three-minute trip every day at the beginning of the workday and the end of the workday using the, the connect card. So for me, that that just illustrates um, that there's a very specific trip that makes a lot of sense on a bike share bike that that people may have not been taking in the past because of either the cost uh, or or other barriers with you know payment or something like that. I'll follow up really quick. The one thing that would be really useful in this analysis or this question is if the transit agencies knew um, where the transit riders exit the bus. So in our city, they don't. They tap their card when they enter the bus. And then when they leave the bus, there's no kind of second transaction that happens there. So to try to link the actual location that the person exited the bus or the light rail and then link that with a trip on healthy ride becomes a lot more difficult we can kind of see the timing so we could see as an example if someone started a bus trip at a specific time and then took took a bike share a healthy ride trip within you know 15 or 20 minutes of that you can kind of gauge where that person may have gotten off the bus but 
Um, that'll be a challenge for every city. I'm not sure too many others, if there's any cities that do that. Next question. Um, Pittsburgh, you mentioned that your transit agency agreed to advertise on the inside of their vehicles. Um, another city has tried a similar partnership, but they were told by their transit agency that the bus and rail ads are contracted through a third party and they are unable to offer partners free ads. Do you know if your transit agency uses a third party or if you have had to deal with a similar structure? And this can be a question open to Milwaukee as well. In Pittsburgh, the transit agency uses a third party to, to administer the contracts at bus shelters in the out-of-home advertising, but they do internally on, on the exterior and interior of the buses. So in Milwaukee, we do work with a third party company called Direct Media for our on-bus advertising, but as part of that contract, and I would encourage, um, and probably most systems I know have this, you we have the ability to get some space uh, per month or per quarter um, and for, for things like this partnerships. So um, particularly for working with another nonprofit, um, probably would have a harder time. They might be more angry if we try to do something with McDonald's, but uh, for the bike share, I think it there was no pushback at all. And again, we had that part of the contract, we can do those things. So. Thank you. Um, our next question is, so how do you all handle um, rebalancing during rush hour um, with your new programs that are um, apparently increasing ridership and the number of users that are using your services? Uh, in Pittsburgh, we are able to accommodate the increased demand using our existing rebalancing strategies. There was n very little change to that. Yeah, we um, obviously at rush hour, we are, we've, we're more vigilant about balancing, trying to make sure that we're not uh, having anyone miss, miss a trip to work or a connection to work. Um, but we didn't see enough of a change that required any change in our current balancing strategies. We're always looking for ways to improve them and are always improving them, but we didn't see a specific need related to this. Thank you. So how do you all anticipate using the data collected from um, these new programs and specifically Pittsburgh with your free 15 minutes to reallocate the number of bikes or locations served? Uh, yeah, great question. Um, and one for us that's particularly important as a, um, a smart bike system, you know, we have these kiosks, but our, our, our bikes don't require them to start or end a trip. Um, and so um, we, we definitely see uh, additional capacity for, for more trips to and from transit and we're really focusing in 2018 on both adding bikes into the system, but also adding a lot more stations near uh, near transit and in the catchment area of transit. So not just along the routes, but, you know, 15 or between a five and 15 minute bike ride away from some of our more premium um, transit services like our busways and our light rails. Um, and so we really are, are thinking about how we locate our stations, um, these very lightweight stations. Some of them are very small, like four or six docks um, to make um, our, our coverage over the area served by transit um, just really dense and and um, and really useful for for transit riders. Next question: um, Have you all incorporated these programs into TDM programs through data collection? Are you able to conceptualize or quantify reduction in VMT? If so. Has this information been a solid point of persuasion? If not, why? Uh, this is Brendan with Transit in Milwaukee. Um, I only understood about half of those terms, so I assume we're not using it, but I'll let uh, Bubbler. I, I didn't know what half of those were either. <laughs> I'm sorry, we're gonna, I'm gonna have um, my colleague Aaron, sorry, rephrase the question. Yeah. 
Uh, hi, this is Aaron uh, Villarreal and Acto, everyone. Um, so the the question is specifically: Are you using this part of a like a transportation demand management strategy, and like are you using are you partnering with employers um, or um, with a, a city office that that works on TDM programs um, as a way of specifically reducing vehicle use? And uh, at this point, do you have any data on on if this is having an impact on that? Um, and do you find that to be a compelling argument when you're talking about it? Um, Adams may have some thoughts here. From my perspective, we have not um, um, operationalized the the data yet. Um, so we're still pretty early in our pilot project. We're just uh, three months into it so far. Um, but that that's the goal, right? I mean that that what the question is kind of hinting at what why we're in this business or why we show up to work every day, which is to um, to kind of change the way that people move around our city. And it will, we certainly hope to use the data that we collect to be able to present to our transit agency, um, the Port Authority, to, to, to partner in really interesting and creative ways with um, partner to work agencies, with um, transitional agencies that are encouraging people to um, get to work in alternative ways beyond single occupancy vehicle trips. Um, we do think that there that this will have a significant impact on reducing VMT. We just haven't been able to um, demonstrate those numbers yet because of how early it is in the process. Yeah, I, I also would mention um, we, like a lot of bike share systems, have um, a, uh, a corporate membership option that's a, a paid option uh, for larger employees, um, many, um, many of whom are kind of uh, using that as a, both an employee benefit, but also as a way of you know, reducing their um, need for parking or, um, um, uh, or as a demand management strategy. So um, we, we've had a lot of growth in our corporate memberships over this past year. Um, it's, a really, um, it's a really popular product. Um, so this is, I guess, a little bit addressing a different um, a different uh, customer base. It's it's um, uh, people who might not have uh, um, a, an employer who's willing to subsidize the cost of a bike share membership or something like that. We're able to still give them a really easy um, way into the system. Um, so it, it sort of uh, goes hand in hand with the other membership options that we have available. Yeah, it's, it's similar to say, like for us, it is, it's, it's also really early. We introduced it in the fall. Um, once we have a, like a summer of operation, then we'll have some data to look at. Um, and obviously we'd hope to use that to, to do something useful. <laughs> um, but uh, just right now it's, it, it is, it's similarly just too early for us to, to say exactly. Thank you. Um, our next question is for Bubbler and MCTS. Can you discuss joint maintenance for stations and stops? Who employs these workers, and are they trained by both organizations? Uh, it is not currently something we have yet. Um, so it's one of our to-dos in the future. Um, we are currently working on a, uh, we're in project development with the FTA on a bus rapid transit route. So that would be um, one of our first needs for real robust maintenance of stations. Um, and you know, I know Bubbler's been hand, handling it on their own. Um, we're also, the, the city of Milwaukee is also in the middle of, um, or actually getting towards the end of ha bringing a streetcar online, they'll have some other stations. So uh, there's, there's opportunities, there's been discussions, but it, at this point, that's all it's been. Thank you. Um, our next question um, is for PGH. How do you handle the liability waiver for people jumping on your bikes? Uh, yep. So we, the user, when they uh, when they connect or link their account at our kiosks, is required to accept the terms and conditions and the liability waiver. It's part of the. It's the first step in the workflow. Yeah, we, we designed the onboarding process to require, you know, the least amount of information and interaction as possible, but that was something that we had to have. So that is uh, a part of every user's um, onboarding process, whether they're linking a connect card or trying to come in with a credit or a debit card. Okay. 
Um, also for uh, PGH, <laughs> you mentioned having neighborhood advocates to help create public awareness. In what ways are your neighborhood advocates able to carry your message to the community outside of social media? Also, what events or programs have you or will you host and what have you found most successful? Uh, so the neighborhood ambassador program will be starting in 2018. We haven't done it yet. Uh, we're really excited that those folks will be doing a lot of community events and uh, hosting individual rides, tabling at events. But what has worked for us, I can tell you, um, are events where we actually distribute the, the, the connect card, the transit pass here, where we, where we go to um, a place where other, other events, existing events, and we partner with other um, community organizations or corporate or business partners to show up to a business and we give away the connect cards and register simultaneously register people. Um, those are fantastic. They're by far the best ways that we found of engaging with people. You kind of do everything all at once. Thank you. And our very last question for today um, that we will talk about on the webinar because again we will follow up and send you all questions that were unable to be answered during our time here today. Our last question is, are there formal agreements between the transit agency and bike share providers specifying what data is shared with each other and how it is used? And this is a question for Milwaukee. Nope. <laughs> we do not have a, uh, a, a formal agreement. It's all been uh, Good, it's, it's all been on goodwill and right I mean as both I guess as both we're both in in the same boats right we're both kind of uh, we're a gov the trans system is kind of a governmental nonprofit and bubbler is a nonprofit I mean so um, we're, we're dealing with similar audiences and similar uh, issues um, I think if there ever became a mixing of money um, that would have to be uh, brought about, but at this point, it's mostly just been kind of on the marketing side and somewhat on the the operational side, but no money that gets mixed. So there's been no no real need to red tape it up too much. In Pittsburgh, we were required to do that. So we have a contract with the transit agency. It's a memorandum of understanding that outlines exactly what data will be shared from our organization to the Port Authority and what data the Port Authority is unwilling to share from their side to us. Um, but they did uh, share with us um, a list of all of the, of the user IDs of their transit pass holders. So that, in order for them to do that, it, it did require a, a pretty extensive legal review of, of that data sharing. Great, thank you so much. And we see a bunch of questions coming in about sharing the slides and um, today's webinar, and both will be available to you, so do not worry about that. Um, there are a number of great upcoming events and opportunities at NACTO. Our first is a public engagement that counts webinar on February 6, 2018. Um, that'll be at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Our next webinar, um, we'll be having is on NACTO's new All Ages and Abilities Guidance on February 20th, 2018. And if you're headed to the Sustainable Communities Conference in Ottawa, make sure you check out NACTO's training on multimodal street design on February 7th. Also, stay tuned for the release of NACTO's annual bike share data snapshot, which should be out um, by the end of this month and summarizes the state of bike share across the U.S. And if you're interested in any of these events and need additional information, feel free to send an email. And with that, thank you all for calling into today's webinar. We want to give a very big thank you to our presenters today for sharing this great information with us. Um, again, we will be sending out unanswered questions to you all, and we will also send the um, slides and today's webinar presentation. So you all can do a virtual round of applause for our presenters. And as always, think through what resources or information you might want NACTO to host or develop in order to help you best address the bike share issues in your city. We are wholly dedicated to supporting you all. I would love to hear from you, so please don't hesitate to reach out with ideas, questions, and comments. You all have a great afternoon.